right. Um, our CPU is the uh, Camellia CPU. Um, written by yours truly, Eric Tran. And we okay. So for the agenda today, we'll be going over the origin of the name uh, Camellia, go over the overview of the processor design, understanding uh, floating point, then going on to our floating point enhancements, then wrap it up with closing and QA. So what's a uh, camellia, you ask? Um, basically, it's a flowering plant native to Eastern and Southern Asia. It's known for its really rapid growth rate, and when it becomes fully bloomed, it becomes really large and really bright, and it makes like you know, a bold statement, you know, the symmetrical structure and whatnot. So we kind of wanted to elude our processor design fundamentals with the way the, the camellia structure is. So, you know, one of the main fundamentals we learned in the computer architecture class is, you know, simplicity is key. And I think that, you know, like the way it looks simple, it's nothing too complicated, but it looks, you know, really bold. Um, that's kind of what we were going for, for our processor. So that's why it's named uh, Camellia. All right. So, um, like all the other processors here, it's uh, designed on the Harvard memory architecture, meaning that it has two separate memories for uh, separating the instruction memory and the data memory. Um, it, uh, the data is organized as big NDN, meaning the uh, um, large, the front of the bits are going to be in the uh, the beginning. Um, okay. So the first bit is the most significant. Yeah, first bit is the most significant in the uh, big Indian thing. And so um, our base uh, integer register file is 32 by 32 bit. So and that's to perform all the usual MIPS baseline instructions that were required. And then our enhancement was the floating point register file, which is um, also uh, there's. It, it's 64-bit, but there's a, also just 32 registers, of each with the size of 64-bit. Um, the reason why it has to be 64-bit is for is due to the implementation in Verilog, where um, the uh, co the conversion to a floating point has to be uh, at minimum 64 bits. So that's why we have to change it up. And this is uh, our, uh, basically our whole CPU module, but um, this is the part that is the Harvard architecture part. Although um, this could, uh, could technically be a part of it, the I.O. memory module for input and output, it, since it's basically considered memory to the uh, control unit, um, but yeah, so we have the data memory module down here, the instruction unit module up here, and yeah, there's general, they're wired pretty much identically, and yeah. So overview of our instruction set architecture, we have 47 instructions total. 35 are from the MIPS baseline instructions, and the remaining 12 are enhanced instructions, three of which are the input, output, and ready, and then the remaining are for the floating point arithmetic and uh, load and store rate. We have three baseline instruction formats, R-type, I-type, and J-type, and two enhanced floating point instruction formats, which we will call FP-R-type and FP-I-type. Um, just as um, with the baseline enhanced, all instruction formats are 32 bits wide. And that includes the 64-bit uh, instructions, too. So the it's um, or the ones that operate on 64-bit uh, data. So using 30, we still use a 32-bit instruction to uh, do 64-bit operations. So the floating point data type that our processor handles is a double precision floating point. A double precision floating point is 64 bits wide and contains uh, three uh, bit fields. The first, which is the sign bit, which is one bit, the exponent field, which is 11 bits, and the mantissa 
fraction field which is fixed to this. And I'll be explaining what these fields do shortly. So before we go into the floating point, we have to explain uh, how to understand it. I'm so sorry, it's um, It's using the um, IEEE 754 standard, which is a standard widely used um, worldwide on floating point units, on processors. And it's very, and the, the way the numbers are formatted is very similar to scientific notation. So it's as follows, uh, negative one to the power of S times M times two to the power of E. So kind of going before with the, with the bit fields, the S, it stands for the sign, um, based on whether the sign is zero, one, determines if it's positive, positive or negative respectively. Mantissa determines the precision of the number, so you know, the same, in digits, um, and exponent it determines the magnitude of large um, the number, how large it is, how small it is. And again, since we're dealing with double precision, mantissa and exponent are fixed two bits and eleven bits respectively. Um, so, for to elaborate on the exponent, um, the value contained in this exponent field. <clears throat> it's not the actual true exponent. Rather, it's, it contains a biased um, exponent value. So what this means is um, the value contained in this field is as follows. The true exponent plus the bias. So for in the case of a double precision um, data type, the bias would be uh, 1,023. Um, 20, 1, so for example, if we say we have a true exponent of 4, and we want to represent that in an exponent field, we would simply say 4 plus 1,023 gives us a value of 1,027. And so it's a bit um, in binary. That would be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Can you elaborate more on what the uh, bias part actually means? Um, because we... And why is it necessary? We, we need a bias because... Uh, we want to represent um, both like negative and positive values and to allow a wider range of just uh, what's in 11 bits we had a bias. So let's say if the exponent is um, on all zeros except for the last bit, we'll, we'll elaborate why um, there's special values um, if the exponent field is all zeros mm -hmm. or all ones. Um, um, you can get a full range of, I guess, negative to 1,022 to positive 1,023 of the double precision. So without the bias, you wouldn't be able to get that full range. Right. Um, so Mantissa, uh, kind of library before, it determines the precision of the number. Uh, what this bit field represents is the binary fraction. So. Um, at the very first bit right here, it represents 2 to the power of negative 1, which is, in other words, 1 half. And if you go down along the line, 2 to the power of negative 2 would be 1 fourth, 2 to the power of negative 3 would be 1 eighth, uh, etc. Um, <clears throat> for uh, Mantissa, we, have, we make an assumption for a normalized number where that the the binary digit to the left of the binary point is a 1. And that 1 is not explicitly stated in this bit field. So the actual mantissa is 53 bits, but what is explicitly stated in the fraction field is 52 bits. Um, so to give you an example, if we're going to convert a binary um, decimal number of negative 5 to 0.75 to the double precision uh, floating point, uh, we would do as follows. We would take the left digit to the left of the decimal point, convert that to binary, and that's pretty straightforward. To get to the, the right point where the binary fraction, you would multiply the right side of the decimal uh, by 2, and continuing, uh, continuing multiplying the, the remaining right side by 2 until you get a whole number. There's no remainder. Mm -hmm. So once you finish that, then starting from downwards, you will get your binary fraction. So, so it would be 
101.11. Next step, we have to normalize the number um, in the such that it matches the mantissa format, where there's only one digit to the left of the binary point. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a number, it's negative 101.11. We need to move the decimal point over two times, so that would be negative 1.0111 times two to the power of two. So as I said again, we only want to explicitly state the bits on the right side of the binary value, which is 0, 1, 1. But the actual true mantissa is negative mm -hmm. 1 point zero one one one. So that's the bit field. Would be really long if I had to say, but we're mainly considered with the left-hand side, the, the 0, 1, 1, and the rest are zeros. Mm -hmm. and, or in hex, it would be 7 all the way down to 7. Um, to elaborate on the special values, um, we have to be able to demonstrate uh, what a zero is in a floating point. And it's as follows, um, both the exponent bits and the mantissa bits are all zeros. And you can also, um, the, it doesn't matter what the sign bit is, plus zero and negative zero are considered equal. We also have a condition where it's considered a denormalized number. Um, earlier I mentioned that we assume that there's a one to the left side of the binary point in the mantissa. If the case where the exponent bits are all zeros and the mantissa is non-zero, then we now assume that the leading digit is a zero instead of one. And this allows us to have very small numbers. We can represent very small numbers in magnitude by sacrificing a little precision. And that helps us with something we call gradual underflow um, when we're doing uh, floating point arithmetic operations. Next, we also have to represent infinity, and that's represented when all the exponent bits are all ones, and the mantissa bits are all zeros. And with the sign bit, you can distinguish between positive infinity and negative infinity. Lastly, we have uh, not a number, which a number uh, you know, doesn't exist. And we have, without the represent when the exponent bits are all ones, and the mantissa is non-zero. Um, any questions before I, we move on to the implementation of floating point enhancements? I, in researching this, I assume you researched it this semester? Yeah. And you've done a great job so far. When, when would we get not a number? Did you ever? Mm, I believe if you try, if you, let's say you have a floating point and you're trying to, you go out of range. Like on a multiplier or something like that? Yeah. Well, I guess it could be on any arithmetic. Yeah. Um, so kind of like an overflow type thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's worldwide standard. You guys have done a good job of explaining so far. It's great. Yeah. Now, how do you implement it? That's what I want to know. All right. <laughs> yeah. So here's the fun part. So. Please. All right, so we start off by comparing the instruction formats between the two. Here, this is pretty much the R type. It's pretty much identical to the normal MIPS R type um, in that, yeah, there's an opcode, there's a RS, RT, RD. This bit is unused since uh, we do not have a shift, a floating point shift anywhere. So there is no like FP shift amount. And then there's a function bit. Uh, field for the last six bits. So really, this isn't really too hard to explain at all since it, it, it's basically identical. To yeah, just like an R-type. Yeah, uh, just like a normal R-type. Yeah. So, yeah, the only the difference is that the, the register F. sources are dealing with only the stuff in the floating, floating point, point register, register file. Uh, right, of course, so I find that they're practically the same. So uh, when we get to the I-type though, it ends up being, it being a bit trickier since uh, we have to um, make it so it fits the requirements of our uh, baseline MIPS processor, meaning that it requires the enhanced key, which is going to be 1F. Um, so if we wanted to do it, it by having this uh, function field in the end, it limits our immediate field mm -hmm. down to uh, 10 bits. And um, so, in the actual architecture, we had to 
wire it up so that it would just use the the um, bits 15 to 6 of IR. So while we don't have any branches implemented in our current um, version of the uh, processor, it would end up being uh, branches would be limited to you know 10 bits forward or back due to this. So uh, yeah. So what is a floating point I type? What, so do you, what do you do with the immediate value? Do you convert it to floating point? Yeah. Um, uh, it's, this immediate value is not necessary for loading into the register, floating point register. Um, it's rather for the load and store word. So it's for calculating the offset. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So is this for storing floating point numbers? Yes. Loading, loading and, and storing. storing. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So our, our current version of this only uses I type for you know calculating the offset. So this got to so. store two words. Yes. Yeah. Got so it. so far in our version, this immediate value is only used to for the offset. So got it. Although in future versions we can do branches, we can do um, you know whatever a register, I mean a normal integer uh, instruction format would do. So good. So. Here's the actual code of it. What we did, this is, first thing to note is that this is not synthesizable. Right. Um, we found an old module that re re really, this AOU is pretty much identical with the exception of the status lines. But in terms of the case statement and stuff, it's identical to our normal uh, integer AOU. But the only difference is this right here, and this is what makes it unsynthesizable. We have status flags here that ended up being uh, unused in our current implementation, but can be used in the future for various types of branches. Like each um, each of these mean like they're comparisons between S and T inputs to the AOU. So yeah, there's greater than, greater equal, less than, less equal, equal, not equal, and they will all be super helpful for branches. So yeah, anybody looking at this can pretty much easily figure out what's going on. Um, this case statement has the usual instructions. There's, you can pass S, pass T, add the two, multiply, uh, divide. Oh, here's the main difference between this and the other AOU is that we didn't have to have separate modules for it since it's 64 bits. Um, what is it? Multiplying the two can will we'll be able to fit into uh, the output of uh, the 64 bit output. Um, and yeah, that's really it. And then there's passing instructions, and then an increment, decrement. Yeah. Can you elaborate on we found an old module? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, a, it's actually from a previous semester. Oh. Here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. So, how did you implement IEEE? Because I don't know if bits to real actually does IEEE. Well, here's the thing. So, um, the value when uh, the, we compared the, the floating point results uh, in a later slide to from the uh, memory modules, and they ended up being pretty. They ended up being like some were identical and some weren't, and some weren't. Compared so, what to what? So uh, what what we did was we ran the uh, results of the instructions on an online IEEE calculator. Oh, okay. And they came out. Some were identical and some were different. So, so that means you're not doing IEEE. Because well, if they're different, then yours doesn't do IEEE. Right? Right, but well, that's true. So what it is is basically it's a type of floating point that is pretty close to it. Results end up being like close enough that we could consider it that. But the reason why we had the uh, whole theory part on IEEE was to yeah, the basic understanding is still mm -hmm. the same. The basic format yeah, yeah. is still the same. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. So here's what we have to do. The the differences between the floating point data path and the integer data path. So, uh, one of the important parts is the output to a D out, which is well. Previously, it would just be R T would go would be wired straight to uh, D out. But here we have 
since this is 64 bits, our, um, our states are all, for uh, load and store are extended by one. So there's one more state than um, a normal integer data path. So what happens is there's an RT low and RT uh, high that basically this split, we, we split the, the 64-bit value into two 32-bit registers and then use a must to output it into uh, to D out. And uh, this little part right here is a little quirk uh, we had to put in because uh, we were sharing this, the D out wire in the actual um, CPU is shared between this and the uh, integer data path. So we had, uh, we implemented this in the uh, other data path too, so that uh, only one of them could be output at the same time and yeah, it would solve some issues. So here, with the D, with our DN, we have to do something similar to this in that, uh, so that we can load data from the same data memory as, um, same 32-bit data memory. So we would load 32-bit data in one by one, and like this, it would, it would require an extra stage in the uh, state machine. So, yeah, uh, this, we have a case statement, or rather, a mux that uh, would use that that would take in uh, the dy input, or in this case, it's a floating point dy input. To uh, it would take the upper sixty, I mean the upper thirty-two bits first, and the lower thirty-two bits. And yeah, but then other than that, it's all fairly, uh, it's all the same compared to. Uh, the uh, integer data path. It's just there's ha there had to be some extra modifications for for it to uh, work with 64 bits. So, uh, via, what's that the the thing that down the yeah? What is that a tri-state buffer yes, or something it, like that? That's what it basically. Yeah. Yeah. So like it's instead of a mux. Can you elaborate more? Well, we we kind of made it like a mux, but. It would either, based on whether we want to output a D outline, we have it enable. If it's enabled, we would output. Uh, no, so like the D out from here would be output, rather than the D out from right. uh, the integer data path, right. since they share yeah. the same bus, right. the same wire. Yeah. And then if, if it's not enabled, it would simply put high impedance. So then, so then the other one could be output. So the other one, you added high impedance also? Yes. yes. On the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Got it. that was our way yeah. around it. Yeah. Go ahead and move on to the next slide. So um, this is our implement. This is basically that, but in code. Really, uh, the interesting part here is the uh, this case statement, which is how we loaded in the uh, 32 bits. Well, uh, according to well, this went out. This was controlled by the control word. So uh, depending on state, it would load in. You know, the uh, last 32 bits or the first 32 bits and then the last 32 bits into the uh, into DN and which would then go into the uh, registers and then yeah so and then this is our uh, the, the high impedance part that was all was implemented in just one line and uh, yeah do you think there's anything else to Uh, any questions so far? Any questions on yeah the implementation? Because I know uh, some other groups considered uh, doing this, and uh, what stopped them was like to make it synthesizable. Our uh, AOU would have had to be you know, many many modules, many hundreds of lines of code. But we found a way around it by using the bits to Rio. And while yes, it's not true I triple E floating point, the basic concepts are still the same. And um, yeah. What do you mean that it, it would take many, many, many lines of code to implement? Did you so did you look it up? Yes, the, the synthesizable uh, version version of a floating point um, or AOU is millions of times more complicated. Millions. Than this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but 
obviously it's an exaggeration, but it's crazy. And Did you look it up like in an arithmetic textbook? You know, they have textbooks on computer arithmetic. Yeah. I you imagine it would be many did, pages. So you didn't look it up? But no, um, we, we, I don't we did think see a bunch of... Um, I think it'd be inaccurate to convey to everybody that it's that difficult. Not like millions of... It's not that difficult. I mean, how to deal with the exponent, the mantis. It's not that it's difficult, but rather it's if very, it was more time consuming. Very time oh, for consuming. within yeah, within yeah. your time limit, yeah. definitely. But yeah. I, it's not it's millions. Of, it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it's very doable yeah. um, if you have the time. If yeah. we have time. Yeah. Yeah. So, but what we did look and did our research in for uh, like a synthesizable version, where there were PDFs and like yeah. documents, yeah. like you know, all over Google on how like these people got it done and. Yeah, we didn't think it was realistic to get it done within our time frame. It w wouldn't have been. Out. It wouldn't so, have really been, yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, that's what really what I was trying to convey rather than yeah. it being yeah. you know, a million times more difficult. <laughs> so, uh, so, next slide. All right, so that's what I'm carrying mm -hmm. on. So, for testing our enhanced instructions with Floating Point, uh, we use uh, we implement instruction memory module and data memory module. These first four instructions implement a uh, floating point load word and it's simply using a value from R0 from the integer register file and adding an offset to it. And remember that the data memory only has 32 bits wide of data, so we have to reference two words. Um, so uh, when we reference the first one with zero, we go to the first line in data memory and we fetch the, uh -huh. the higher bits and then uh, we increment it through the state machine to fetch the, the next line, the next word we've added. Um, then for here, through lines 7 to 14, we perform arithmetic operations on floating point registers. Uh, we do a move, at subtract, uh, multiplication, division, increment, and decrement on registers, uh, floating point registers rather, 5 through 11. And then lastly, we do an OR immediate, which is a regular R type instruction. Um, R1, we set it to the address mm -hmm. C0 because we want to store uh, the result of R4 to the address in data memory. And then we, we complete that using a floating point store word instruction. Oh, before you go on, uh, some interesting things to note are uh, like. Notice how our, since R zero is always going to be zero, we use that to our advantage, and made, and it made it much easier for us to uh, load stuff from the data memory since we could just load it from the beginning of the data memory rather than from you know somewhere else, which would have been more slightly more difficult to implement. But um, yeah, and just for everybody's. Awareness, the oh, value like 13.97, how did yeah. you actually compile that 64 bit into oh, so, the. So uh, we used a uh, converter, an online converter. Through, okay. uh, um, I think these are actual uh, IEEE values that we put in. So uh, this would, this converted through um, an, online, an IEEE converter rather than the uh, bare logs, bits to real. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, so the input. So we had. One po a, a small positive number, a small negative number, a large positive number, and then the larger negative number, and uh, to demonstrate. Yeah, it's a good test. Each of them. Yeah, good test. So we have four different values. Let's go. So here are the results of the operations. Mm -hmm. um, as stated before, through registers one and four, we do a low word from data memory. Uh, we are able to successfully get uh, the whole 64-bit value with only 32 bits at a time from data memory. And from here, uh, we do FP operations. So uh, this register five just gets a move, and we do addition, subtract, multiplication, uh, so on and so on. And then lastly, we did the OR instruction so that we could load 64-bit uh, Results into data memory, and uh, this demonstrates that even though the result is 64 bits, we can do um, the most the higher bits first um, at C0, and then the, the 
the next floor bits at C4. Good. So, um, yeah, so here's where uh, earlier I uh, mentioned how uh, the results slightly differ from the uh, triple E is um, when we're actually doing the operations here, they uh, we use bare logs bits to Rio rather than the uh, triple E implementation. So some of the results end up being the same while some ended up being slightly different. Like for example, um, if I remember correctly, uh, let's see, the, 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 the multiply and the divide ended up being different. Had we, uh, you know, done it by decimal and then threw it in a converter rather than, um, it, it was different from that compared to this value here that was spat out by the uh, AOU. So, yeah. Move on to the next one. Yeah, closing. Yeah. So, for future enhancements, um, like we've mentioned earlier, our immediate instructions floating point is only used to calculate the sign offset for a low word store word. What we would like to do is have a way to um, add immediate values to do arithmetic operations or load into the floating point registers without having to uh, deal with data memory. Um, one way we could have done that is use a leading word uh, past the 32 bits of the initial floating point instruction, uh, but we uh, couldn't implement that on time. Another feature has we also like to do is exception handling. Um, dealing with floating point, there's a lot of times where you could do something illegal, like uh, not, a, not a number, you don't want to be using uh, a floating point value that's not a number, it could you know, cause catastrophic uh, things to your mm -hmm. program. So we wanted to add a way such that uh, we provide information to the programmer uh, to notify what exactly went wrong in the processor so that the program or the OS can handle it. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, and the other stuff that we would do is pipelining and you know direct access cache memory. Uh, we like we would expect this processor to do like uh, it would give it the capability to do many many more instructions at a time. And um, yeah, that's really it. So like yeah, with the arithmetic, the, the immediate instructions. There's so much more we could have done. You know, like branches. The same ones from a floating point data path, threw them in, but yeah, simply there just wasn't enough time. So, yeah. Any questions? What did you do with the floating point status flags? Uh, so that. Did um, you actually register them and just? They they are registered. They are like implemented. Just like the integer flags. They're just not used in any instructions. Yeah. Right. No instructions. Yeah. Yeah. Did so. you push them on the stack uh, at interrupt time? Just like. Oh, uh, we did not do. That that was, uh, yeah, that was something that we did know, but we did not uh, okay. implement that. So. Yeah. Any more questions? Everybody sleepy, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> really good job, you guys. Thank you. Thanks for.